Welcome back. Before the break, we had the sonorous voice, the most appropriate thing for us to enjoy the season with. Yes. And uh, that was Ibukun Adelegon. Beautiful voice. Now, our next guest is Dokun Adediji. He's a DG, the Christ Against Drug Abuse Ministry, Kadam. And it's a, a faith-based NGO which caters to the treatment and rehabilitation of drug addicts. He is a medical doctor, he's a prolific writer, and a deeply committed and passionate Nigerian. Thank you, Dr. Dukwa Dediji, for joining us. Thank you very much, John and Helen. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, Merry Christmas to you. And today, I wish you the same. Today is Boxing Day. That's why we're reaching you this morning to look at the act of giving. All right, so what do Very you... Appropriate. Thank you. What do you mean when you say you have an uncanny understanding of how the human mind works? Um, thank you very much, Kelly. You know, the interesting thing is sometimes it's likely to think that because I'm a medical doctor, it gives me an inroad into people's mind. Not exactly. But I think it's just by nature, the person that I am. I like to introspect about people. I like to watch people closely. I'm very observant. And you don't need to tell me things before I appreciate what you're going through. And uh, you know, my life has been fashioned in them, and I'm also coming from the background that I have. And so the, the thing is, I see people before they begin to understand themselves or before I begin to even interact with them. And that is one thing I think we all need to do, just as uh, the last guest said. Too many times we are too encumbered with the thing that concerns us, forgetting that too many people that are collateral or corollary to our own life and that must be met to make our own life meaningful. I, I think that's what I would just say in a nutshell about how I got into all this. Well, that, that, that worries me a bit because it means that uh, anytime I'm around you, I have to be careful <laughs> because you can almost see through, you can almost see through me. Exactly. Now, uh, <laughs> Doctor, uh, what was really going on in the mind of uh, Mr. Reginald Bassi? I'm sure you saw his, the interview with him. Yeah, what do you is. think was going on in his mind when he decided to gift that young man a dose of forgiveness? You, you see, that there's something that I want all of us to understand. There's always a, a, a Damascus conversion in everyone who gives his time to it. He probably was just living his life, he's comfortable, he can go somewhere to eat and all the rest of it, and mm. he really does not see other people around about him. Yeah. But somehow this episode, in a divine manner, touched him, and then he began to see life in a different perspective, which I think is what every one of us should pray to have, so that we can understand that the whole of humanity is bound by the same cord. No matter the color, no matter the skin, no matter your language, no matter your disposition in life. Would that... I'm glad that he, he made his own conversion in an innocuous manner, which I pray that each and every one of us we have, and then we will understand you see, and then maybe by the time we begin to talk, we begin to understand how this begins to manifest in our daily living and in the things we do in our lives. Would that, would that have been an um, uh, observation, a, a, a very strong instinct for observation, for observing things? Or Is it a special this, gift? I'm, I'm trying to run away from this divine, divine thing. Yeah, yeah I understand. Yeah. You, you, you see, John, let me tell you something. There is no human being that does not know good from bad. That is one thing I want us to know. Sure. One thing is, what probably happened to him at that time was just a, a knack of understanding a different perspective from what he had been used to. And then he began to see this person, how did he get into this? How would a man that I'm seeing that looks presentable that is not a young man, who predisposed to doing come to the supermarket, uh, come to an eatery and go away with the phone and immediately dispose of it and all that. You see, it takes, it takes, let me share with you something Hello, that I know you know. My name is Megan Megan Marco I'm here to see read you. Osp wrote, wrote a story in the New York Times about, are you okay? 
She said she was standing somewhere in Africa when the journalist who saw her, she was she's a princess, she has everything, she has a prince as a king. The man journalist saw something that others did not say, Are you okay? And she said that it meant a lot to her. Mm. That is what has happened to Mr. Bassey. And I think is what we should begin to look. If you read the story again on Meghan Markle, you begin to understand what the whole world is missing and why we're the in the, in the dangerous times we are in and we're struggling with things that we should not struggle with. But okay. you, you see, he also had the, uh, he also had the benefit of uh, his knowledge of technology, advanced knowledge of technology and the application. Yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, that maybe sharpened, <clears throat> sharpened his instinct. In a, in, because for me, personally, I'm, I'm not even sure that I would have had the the uh, uh, the the, uh, the knowledge such that would direct me first to the CCTV at the E tree and mm. basic things mm. like mm. that. Mm. Mm. So, um, mm. d do we all need to go to school for this? No, there are a lot of lessons to learn from that experience, both for no, no. Mr. Bass uh, and Helen and, and John. Yeah. You really, you really don't need any special attribute to do. What just happens is the moment of introspection. And when you have that moment, it guides you into the action you will take. Mm. Something just hits you out of the blues and you just say, I, 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 you don't have to go to school to learn kindness. I read a book by, by Bill Clinton. The book is called Giving. You then see a young girl of five who decides to go to the beach and clear the beach of the dirt. That's not, that's not about school. That's not about intellectual disposition. That's not about book knowledge. It's just about an, an innate ability to okay. appreciate what is separate, what is out of the ordinary, and what can I do to put it in a regular shape. That's just it. Mm -hmm. It's just about us being human again. We are out of tune with humanity. Mm -hmm. And that's why all these things look like a miracle. How can somebody just do this? Um, Until we come to a point and we begin to understand. Dr. Dr. Dylan, Dr. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, to, sorry to jump in there. I, I want to find out, is this, what, is this what drives you in your ministry? Um, le let me say something. Okay, let me now talk about that. I've never smoked in my life. I've never drank alcohol in my life. I somehow, I just got led to it because of the way that I see people and then I, I was in church one day when it was said that there's a ministry that will cater to this, to that. And I just raised up my hand to you. And what has really helped okay. me is the act of understanding that if I go to any joint in Lagos, some of them have never seen me before, but they've had my name. They'll be saying, well, I'm looking for a duke. I want to candidate you to come on Telegram. I'm standing by them. They have mm -hmm. had a book. You see, they wonder, they say to themselves, how can a man who's never been in our position understand what we go through? Yes. It is just leaving myself open to the possibility of being of help to other people. And it may not be in drugs, it may not be like Vasi, like you. There may be some little things you even do in your environment where you live that you do not understand or appreciate that touches the life of those you live with. And that is why they relate with you in the manner they relate. Your driver, your cook, the man on your street, the shoe shiner. And then you begin to understand, why does this man smile at me and greet me? You had done something that nobody else had done that had touched him. And that's the way the goodness goes about. Mr. Adedeji, I am curious to find out from you. Um, are people like you? Philanthropists, we call them, you know, generally, we, we box you in that category. Are you wired, especially? Mm. Or what is it? At what point in life? It, you talked about an experience. We don't know the specific experience. But based on what you do, your regular job with drug addicts now, people like you, are you wired, especially, you know, to tread in this dangerous terrain, so to speak? No, not exactly. Not exactly. You know, the thing that I will tell you that when you mix with those people and they look, they can see they are very observant too. They are very intelligent people. Then they watch what is driving this person. When they see that it is not pecuniary mm -hmm. and it has nothing to do with maybe ability to receive from them in future, they will totally trust you. That was what happened to me. I, I mean, I just went and then I began to understand them. I began to appreciate that nobody wakes up to be a drug addict. 
nobody takes that decision in life. Something, as Basi said, leads people to do the things they do. But I have gotten the, can, the, the, the uncanny the, the ability to read into them and to understand them. They're very difficult to understand, I must tell you. But the thing is, the moment they trust you, they can do anything for you. I can tell you that many of these people you see on the street, they're not just dropouts. Many of them are graduates, they're professionals. And so until we come to an understanding that something meets someone on the road and that turns the journey our arrived, we may not be able to help them. I, I think I just got into it, not because I had any personal experience of smoking or drinking, but it just dawned on me that there are people, aside from me, who do not have the opportunities that I've had in my life, and that was how I got into it. Mm. Okay. And um, it, it's been a major, major shift in my life. Oh my, why did you, how did you get this? Wow. John, before your next question, I'd like to ask Mr. Adedeji, um, at what point, you know, at what point do you, when do you draw the line, really, between punishing? Because to a lot of us, these people have done some things wrong, many things wrong, and they deserve to be punished. But rather, you're helping them out, and there are people like Reginald Bassi who would, you know, who chose to forgive. Where do you draw the line? And which is more effective? You see, let me, it is difficult to draw the line because you never know the hour. I, I mean, somebody had been to our ministry four times. And it was the first time. This person was an electrical engineer. And then he came, he dropped out, he went back, he went back to drop it, And then he came back. Do you know the first time? Hmm. He became so convinced of his own ability to change and his own ability to become a man again, eventually became a very big pastor living abroad with his own family. You see, it's difficult to draw a line. Until the person dies, I don't draw no line mm. because you never know. Mm. The thing is, I think the area in which we are wrong as a country, as a society, to approach the, uh, the issue of addiction is punishment. That is why we don't get people to change. The thing is, we do not even understand them. We just think that the way to punish, to punish, and then they will punish the society. And that is why a lot of them, under the street, they begin to fester, and then they begin to commit criminal activities. Mm. Look at what Basi said. That man, too, was in drugs. Mm. You see, one thing we must understand is, and look at the change that has come to his life, and that is a change that we manifest for, continual, for continuity that will also help him to help other people. I don't, draw, I don't draw any line. I mean, they misbehave, is natural. But if I also look, I don't want to talk religion. But how many times have we done things against Christian, Christian rights and God? And has he drawn the line against us? If we haven't received any that kind of uh, close, close of doors, why should we close doors to anyone else? Now, uh, well, it's, it's quite interesting. Uh, you've said so much. Now, I want us to turn our attention to our institutions, our correctional uh, facilities. You know, how, how prepared or how tooled up are they, you know, to effect a lot of what you're saying? Because it looks like you're like a you're, you're lone voice out mm -hmm. there. How many of you do we have yeah. in the system? A drop of water in an ocean. You, you know, John, that is the pathetic thing for me. It's a painful question. And it's also derived from the fact that people can't, the people find it difficult to give, either of their time or talent, or even their ability to listen to others to appreciate that your own life is an opportunity, it's a privilege, it is not a guarantee. So until we come to understand that life itself is a gift, we will not be able to help others. Yes, there may not be too many people like me, but one like me, I mean, the people that have passed through us have gone to do other things for other people. It may not be in the area of drugs. But you see, the thing is that we are tooled up because we have got help, maybe from the church, to have a very big place in the where we do the rehabilitation. We take about 200 people a year. We've been able to help close to about four, 5,000 people in the last 20 years. And so, I, I think it depends on interest and the act of uh, just what you've said today by the act of giving about thinking about the next person, your neighbor, your child, your even many of us don't know that our children at home with us are into drugs just because we lack the introspective power of observation. Hmm. And until we come to look, the thing that guides me, and I think that should guide everybody is the belief in humanity. 
every human person is a good person until circumstances turn their goodness into something that we see different. And until we come to that understanding, we may not be able to appreciate how we can go out helping other people. And you say, why should I bother myself? Who led him into drugs? Is it my problem? It is not true. And, so, and it, have, it just, it, sorry, awesome. I, I was going to ask you, have you been able to interface directly with, uh, with our correctional facilities on all of these points? Have you spoken? Um, I have to been to some. I have been to some. Let me say, for instance, many of our correctional centers for drugs, for instance, many of them are just pecuniary basis. They, people are using the pain of other people to make a lot of money. I, I, I don't think that is right. Mm -hmm. If you talk about correctional, like maybe Koyi prison, I've been to some of those prisons. But again, you see, the nature of our daily living is what we visit on these people in the same correctional. We, 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 we superimpose our own uh, lives onto them that look at what is wrong with this person. That's not true. Wow. Anybody who wants to, you know, look, if you want to work in a correctional center, I think people should be trained. People should have the calling to do it. It's not just for the sake of having salaries. I work in a prison. The man in prison today did not choose to be in prison one way or the other. And one thing we must never forget is a day may come. Look at the politicians. Teachers, don't they end up in prison? Then they begin to say, oh, we must change the prison. But the moment mm, they come out, mm, they forget. Mm, mm, mm. Until there is a deep feeling in our heart to be good to the next person, to consider the fate of others, even if we are not in there, we will not be able to do as much as we think we ought to do. Well, Ms. Adedeji, we won't let you go until um, you have helped us um, um, you know, throw some light in this specific direction where my mind has been on for a while. This is a family show. You talked right. about a lot of parents right. do not even know, you know, when the children mm -hmm. or anybody around their world is um, on drugs. Now, what are the tell, yeah. tell signs? How do we, right. how do we begin to begin to guess? And um, what do we do immediately? We find out some of these signs. You see, thank you very much, Helen. You see, the thing is this. If you do not have the attitude of observing and listening, you will even mail the telltale signs. Let, let me say, for instance, how many fathers go to the parents teacher association meeting of their children? They wow. don't. How many, how many people in this day and age, they wake up in the morning at 4.30, they leave their children in the care of domestic staff, and then they go to work? and then come back at night when the children have slept, when do they know the children? When do they have time with them? When it's now weekend to spend time at home, we have social gatherings. We travel everywhere and then we leave our children in the care of domestic staff. If a domestic staff is as good, why is the person a domestic staff? You see, the thing is, when you notice your child is becoming rather unruly, is beginning to wear dark glasses in the house, mm. using strong men's all sweets, and then perfume that are very strong, locking up the door and saying he wants to be a little an introvert. And think, you see, you can only know that when you know how it started. If you don't know who your child is, you will not know when the changes came. So it's so important that you, first of all, understand who your child is. What will your child do that you will know that this is not what your child should do? And then when the changes come, that's why you, women are very good at this. They are the first ones in the home who see changes and say, hmm, my husband, I can see that this was because the other, no, 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 it's just been, that's not true. Listen to the woman. Because they have a natural knack, a natural understanding of the shift in behavior. And so they know. And that's, look, what I'm just saying is, first of all, understand your own environment. Know your children. Spend time with your children. Quality time. And I say this, when a child comes to you and says, Daddy, can I ask you a question? I say, oh, no. Can't you, Junior, can't you say, I'm very busy. I'm busy. So come back later. I guarantee you the child will never come back with the same question. When you now call me and say, oh, Junior, what do you say, oh, no, Daddy, don't worry. I've solved it. He solved it from a wrong perspective. Mm, but don't you think so that... I'm uh, just asking him to be... Yeah, sorry, Dr. Dedeji. Don't you think you that, would be, that would be out of uh, ignorance, you know, lack of knowledge of what to do? Do you have any platforms or do you have any avenues by which you will consistently be advising these parents on these things that we're talking about? And um, we also know that there are some parents who have come to your facility with their words and um, 
you have helped, yes. but then they've fallen back. Mm. What words of encouragement mm. would you give to this category? Just in a few people? minutes. Yeah. Okay, I'll start from what John said. The thing is, yes, schools invite us. They invite me, the different institutions, higher institutions, they invite me. We go to talk to them. Some of them will go on a regular visit every year during the induction program. Churches invite us. Whoever calls us will go to, to do that. And people come to offices for counseling, and then we do, we, we do it free of charge. We, we let them understand. About people coming to the program and backslide. You see, the thing is, what people also don't understand, the fact that the person comes to correctional institution does not change the person entirely if there's no support. Mm. Many times we just bring them, okay, I want, my, mm. I, I want my child to come. When they now go back, you don't offer the support you promised. Oh, we'll do this for you. People just save them at those times to, to, to make the child feel good. But when the child now comes back and says, Would you, what about the business you say you want to start? What about this you want to do? They say, no, no, why don't you wait? That is pushing the person back into a world that he knows. Oh, and on, look, it's about collective support. It's not about Kadam doing the correction for him. We throw him back, and then you leave him again without support. The society does not forgive their stigmatization. And when you stigmatize them, what do you think they do? They find collective responsibility with people that don't challenge them. Hmm. And these are the things that I think as a society must begin to come into, uh, into reality with. Powerful. There, those words again. Last week, we heard about that collective family support yeah. and love and giving attention and quality time, Absolutely. you know, to every member of the family. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Adedeji. Thank you for the work that you do. And um, you can be so Thank assured you. that Plus TV is in this with you. And constantly, we will be coming your way to help, you know, throw Thank more you light. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have well, a nice day. Thank you. Thank you. You thank too. You. Wow, John. Well, for you out there at home, we have been speaking with Dr. Adediji, and um, he's made us to realize that money is not the only commodity, you know, that we can give. Um, we can give our time, we can give our expertise, we can give our love, or simply give a smile. Give a smile. That's awesome. Yes. All right. So. What does that cost? Absolutely nothing. The point is, none of us can ever run out of something worthwhile to give. John. Yes, absolutely. And I'm sure we've taken a lot from Dr. Dedeji. You yes, know. we have. Uh, well, uh, next, Chef Taz will be showing us a simple meal to make for the holiday and right after that. Uh, yeah. On our wellness and life uh, style anchor, uh, Ferran One of my Owoto. favorite yes, person is on with Ferran. With Ferran Owoto, Owoto Mo. Yes. And uh, they'll be wearing many caps. Uh, her skills also ev uh, include event management and production, brands and communications management, product designing, among other things. Well, she'll be speaking also with uh, Pastor Ito Igodalo about the act of giving right after this. It's a day with John and Helen. Hello everyone, my name is Chef Taz. I'm here to teach you a quick and easy pasta recipe which you can use to feed your family over the festive period. We start with the ingredients. You take um, your tomatoes, onions already chopped. You put them in a frying pan with a bit of oil. We're gonna start off with frying the peppers. It's always best to fry your peppers before you blend them. That's what I always do. You take your garlic and your ginger. Toss it in the frying pan. You take your tomatoes. So you put that in the frying pan and allow it to come to a boil. You let it fry till it's very soft and tender. So in here, we're gonna put a bit of salt. You've got your mixed herbs, dry mixed herbs. If you have the fresh ones, it's fine as well. You've also got your all-purpose seasoning. You've got your celery and leeks, which I said you could always get from your local vegetable sellers in the market. This gives it a bit of a natural taste. So I just put it in a bit. So, as you can see, it's been frying for about 20 minutes. 
it's come to a really mushy consistency. I added a bit more of the leek and celery just right now, just to give it another boost. At this junction, I also add some tomato paste. So I add one, two, three. This is going to give it some redness and also some thickness to the paste. So I just allow that to fry as well for another five minutes. You can see we're having a thick paste here. It's almost looking like some fried stew. This is exactly what we're looking for. So once this has fried for a bit, we allow it to cool down and then toss in the blender for the final blend. As you can see here, you've got a creamy tomato blend. So we take that and pour it in the pot for it to cook. So while this is boiling away, we're gonna start with the next step, which will be to boil the pasta. So right here, I've got a pot of water. I'm gonna add some sugar. Sugar is a sweetener, just like salt. I don't know why a lot of people run from it. The moment you mention sugar, it's almost like, how can you put sugar in your food? But hey, salt, sugar, they're both sweeteners. So I put in two cubes in there. I take my salt. What I do, I tend to make the water quite salty and allow the pasta boil in it so that when I'm actually cooking, I don't have to add in more salt. Once your pasta is sweet enough, the amount of salt you put at the end very little, which always leaves a tingly taste at the back of your mouth. So it's best to season your water with salt and sugar to a salty level before boiling in your pasta. There's a myth that you should always add oil to your pasta while boiling it, but hey, I'm against it. I'm really not for it. I'm not against it, but it doesn't really matter. Oil or no oil, it's fine. The most important thing is when it's ready, cool it down in water and then toss in oil. That's the most important one. This I will be using for my chicken breast and sausages. So add a bit of my complete seasoning to the chicken. A bit of dry chili flakes. But not too much since you've already got some pepper in the tomato toss. I've got the mixed herbs, dry mixed herbs, put in there. I'm not going to be adding salt because the complete seasoning already has a bit of salt. The next time I'll be adding salt would be when I want to finish up both the pasta and the chicken at the same time. So I'm going to allow this to fry for a bit. Let me turn up the heat. And the water is boiling. It's almost coming to a boil. I'm going to take on the sausages and I also add to the chicken. You really don't want the chicken dry. Once it comes to you can see that the color has changed from me being raw. Remember, it's still going in the tomato sauce, so you don't want it dry and crunchy. You still want your chicken juicy, soft, and melt in the mouth. I've got my water boiling here, so I'm going to toss in my pasta. Pasta usually takes about five minutes. So I'm going to allow my pasta boil to be al dente. Al dente means you just want it just a bit soft enough, but still a bit hard. So while the pasta is boiling, the chicken and sausage are ready. We deal with the chicken breast. So you get a non-stick frying pan, preferably. You've got your rosemary leaves. You have your garlic. I let it fry a bit just to get the flavors out of the garlic and the rosemary leaves. Then we take the chicken breast, remember that? Put it in the frying pan. Shallow frying, remember please, not deep frying. Back to our pasta while wow, that is frying. This has probably done five minutes. We take that and you strain it al dente. I don't know if you can see the white round line in there. That's what al dente is. So it's soft on the inside, on the outside, and still a bit hard on the inside. So I'm going to take it down now with a bit of room temperature water, which is basically tap water, so that your pasta doesn't get too soft. We check on the chicken. Add a bit of salt to it, your mixed herbs, and we cover it again. So in here, my empty frying pan, you put in your tomato sauce, chicken and sausages, toss them all oil in there with the oil, remember? I've got my chicken and my sausages, back to my complete seasoning. I call it complete seasoning because basically it's a mix of everything. You've got your salt, your spices, it's got a bit of garlic and ginger in there. It's 
just complete seasoning for me. You could use any brand, like I say. So you put a spoon in there. It's all to taste, really. And then you throw in your pasta. So I'm sure you can see that the tomato sauce isn't too thick. But we would add a bit of water just so that it would allow it to simmer as it gains getting burnt. So while that is simmering, I've got a green pepper here. I sprinkle on top. I lower the heat and I dish onto my plate. Remember our chicken breast? So you can see it's slightly brown. It's not burnt, just okay. I put it over here on the chopping board and I slice. And so I just take it with my knife and I place on my pasta. And there you go. So there you go. A quick and easy pasta dish for you and your family to enjoy over this holiday, especially today being Boxing Day. So as you sit down to unbox your gifts given by your loved ones, please do make sure to have this quick meal. Happy Boxing Day everyone and Happy New Year in advance. Thank you.